everyone. Um, welcome back to um, Epidemics of Injustice. Um, as always, please start by introducing yourself in the chat with your name and your pronouns. Um, complete the check-in if you haven't done so already. Um, as always, again, during the presentation, please put any questions or comments that you have in the chat. Um, and there will always be time, well, let me not say always, but we always try to make time for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, as you will probably see, um, you are going to be muted. Um, just that while with the presentation is going on, um, we can really focus on our guest speaker for today. Um, if you are using your phone, please remember to mute your line. Um, and you can always use the chat box to um, comment throughout the presentation. Again, as a reminder, I'm Zoe Harris. Um, I'm a student in the School of Public Health, and I'm joined by Wendy, Marjorie, and Dondini. Just a brief about the course for people who have not joined us before. This course is free and open to the public. Um, it starts at 5.30 CST, and it's sponsored by the Collaboratory for Health Justice here at the UIC School of Public Health. Um, again, like we do every single week, just a quick content warning um, that what we might be talking about today can be difficult. Um, so if you feel like you need to step away at any time, um, please do so. Again, uh, I know we do it every single week, but we just really feel that it's important. So just to remind everyone, the University of Illinois at Chicago stands on the original homelands of the Miami Three Fires people, the Ojibwe, Adawa, and Badawanami, who've been stewards of this land for generations. Illinois is home to a diverse native community of more than 75,000 tribal members, many of whom live in the Chicago area. And for those who are not currently residing in Chicago, we do encourage you to look into the indigenous people of your own lands. And now we're just going to jump right into it, um, and I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. David Stovall, who is a professor in the Departments of Black Studies and Criminology, Law, and Justice here at UIC. His scholarship investigates three areas, critical race theory, the relationship between housing and education, and the intersection of race, place, and school. In the attempt to bring theory to action, um, he works with community organizations and schools to address issues of equity, justice, and abolishing the school prison nexus. His work led him to become a member of the design team for the Greater Lawndale Little Village School for Social Justice, which opened in the fall of 2005. Furthering his work with communities, students, and teachers, his work manifests itself in its involvement with the people's education movement, a collection of classroom teachers, community members, students, and university professors in Chicago, Los Angeles, and the San Francisco Bay Area, who engage in collaborative community projects centered in creating relevant curriculum. In addition to his duties and responsibilities as a professor at UIC, he also served as a volunteer social studies teacher at the Greater Lawndale Little Village School for Social Justice from 2005 to 2018. So if you all please welcome Dr. David Snowball. Yay. Well, thanks again, everybody. And uh, let me first send a shout to Jenny Heber Barron for uh, even thinking about me as somebody to, part to participate in the Epidemics of Injustice uh, work. And then Zoe, Marjorie, Wendy, um, Nandini, uh, and the folks at Radical Public Health for coordinating with me and getting everything together, because I know it's a lot going on. And I want to first say uh, to really thank everybody for surviving the three pandemics of white supremacy, capitalism, and COVID-19. Because I think it's important to put those in conversation where now we have COVID in the forefront, but what we are really understanding is that white supremacy and capitalism have only deepened because of what COVID has brought to the table. So now when you think about the mix of those three things, it puts us in a different conversation and it allows us to really understand not just health endemics or something that is now considered to be burgeoning on the, uh, space of being permanent, but also to think about things like pandemics 
and pandemics really just meaning the word pandemic just meaning an issue or concern across region or nation. So now when we think about these things of white supremacy, capitalism, and COVID, it puts us in a different conversation. Now, what I hope to do today is a couple of things. One is to situate the current critical race theory moment, but also to explain critical race theory, right? Because a lot of times what we're getting is kind of a boogeyman conversation about what CRT is. And we're not really getting into what it was intended to do, what it does, and then how it's asking us and challenging us to think about questions for the future. And with you all as folks in public health and medicine, in your uh, health-based professions, behavioral uh, sciences and physical sciences, now it forces us to think about something in a particular way. Let me start with the uh, history, if we will, of critical race theory. Easy way to understand critical race theory. Critical race theory came as a response to something that was called critical legal studies. Critical, the main argument of critical legal studies was that the criminal legal system in the United States is a system that is a class-based system. Folks like Derrick Bell, who's often considered to be the grandfather of critical race theory, in 1973, he wrote a book called Race, Racism, and American Law. As folks in critical legal studies were writing about the ways in which the law operated as this class-based system, Derrick Bell offered something different and said, we need to think about the ways in which the criminal legal system is also a race-based system, a gendered-based system, a system that is based on sexual orientation, age, disability. And now we have to think about how those things have been ingrained in the US critical legal, the US criminal legal system. And a group of his students actually had a conference in Madison, Wisconsin in 1989. That's when we first see the term critical race theory, right? And it was about legal scholarship. It was about the critique of legal jurisprudence. And there were some assumptions or some tenets. I, would, I shouldn't say assumptions, but there were tenets in that particular uh, conference that came out. And in 1995, a very popular book called Critical Race Theory, Key Writings That Formed the Movement came out, which kind of gave a synopsis of the writings that folks were pulling from CRT along with some of the foundational writings from the construct. So it's important for me to put that history out there because in so many ways, critical race theory, if you see the battle for school boards and I just saw that the graphic novel Mouse was um, banned in a public school district in Tennessee. Many of you all may have read Mouse in seventh to eighth grade in high school now is considered um, deviant or um, pornographic. What was it? it used another term to describe it. And it's thing around like, I can't tell you how many schools I've been in across the country that have used mouse. And now when we see CRT, it's largely become a boogeyman because the battle in K-12 public schools isn't really about CRT as much as it, is, as it is about entertaining critical perspectives in curriculum and instruction, right? So CRT just becomes the boogeyman. So let's get into how it becomes the boogeyman. In March of 2020, there was a guy by the name of Christopher Rufo, who is a research fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And he was on Fox News and he was talking about microaggressions. Now, microaggressions, many of you all have seen that term. For folks who are unfamiliar, microaggressions just means the daily interactions with racist practices or interactions that now have longitudinal effects on the body and mind. So Chris, Christopher Rufo was arguing against this and he was saying, this is the problem with uh, microaggressions is it relies too heavily on these assumptions. People just need to get a grip and 
understand that our society is based on the individuals. And if we just pay attention to that, everything will be okay. And then he named critical race theory as something that actually speaks to microaggressions. During this broadcast, Donald J. Trump was watching it. He looks and he sees, what is this? This is, this is terrible. A month later, you get executive order 13950, banning the use of critical race theory in any federal trainings and any conversation that talks about one race being better than the other or placing blame on folks. And then you start to see this kind of watershed of folks starting to name critical race theory. Now, during this naming, very few people know what it is. So then people start associating it with Marxist theory. People start associated, so associating it with the Frankfurt School of Philosophy and Theory. People start associating it with a number of different things without really getting into what critical race theory is purporting. And I think this really becomes important for folks like yourselves in public health, in medicine, in the, the behavioral and physical sciences to understand that what critical race theory is naming is that racism is endemic to life in the United States. So what does that mean? Life in the United States is based not only on agreed upon system of hierarchies, but it is ingrained in the policies that actually govern this country. First example is the three-fifths clause of the Constitution. Remember that at one time, it was white male landowners who could vote. Before they named, they tacked on the white to it, it was male landowners. And the issue was a state, was the state of South Carolina that had black male landowners who they feared if they voted would end slavery. So in order to prevent this, they actually create this particular part of the document that says African descended people would only be counted as three fifths of a human being to actually engage in voter disenfranchisement. And what are we talking about today in 2022 that Congress still can't approve? Voter disenfranchisement. So this particular issue is one that has come from the inception of the United States. Another example, the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment in slavery, except for punishment for a crime. And this becomes important because for the lawyers out there, you know that every contract has what's referred to as a convenience clause. The Constitution has a convenience clause embedded into the 13th Amendment that says, slavery is, is abolished except for punishment for a crime, right? And they use the term involuntary servitude. Many of you all have seen the documentary 13th, but it's important to understand that the language is still used. So if somebody is sentenced in certain states, it still reads on the docket that they are sentenced to X amount of days, months, or years of involuntary servitude. The 14th Amendment, the right to due process, meaning that folks have the right to be represented fairly and have access to be represented in the courts. It's a bunch of problems with that. And if the summer of 2020 didn't remind us about the structural issues with due process, I don't really know what does, right? So now if we think about these things, it allows us to understand that racism, white supremacy should never be reduced to individualized acts of bigotry. Instead, we should understand them structurally, right? Another example is the 15th Amendment, which is the right to vote. And we see where that is right now, as many states have created 
particular sets of legislation that prevent people from voting because they feel that too many folks voted. It wasn't the fact of the vote being stolen. Republicans always operate on a strategy of fewer people voting. So now they can lean on the lie that the election was stolen by creating legislation that prevents what they already intended to do. So now if we think about this in this particular way, critical race theory is saying, we need to understand this not as happenstance, but as everyday understandings around white supremacy. Now, let me say something about white supremacy, because I know as academics, we, uh, we can say, we can use a lot of words and not explain a damn thing, right? And then get mad when you ask a question about what we did not explain. So let me interrupt that by explaining white supremacy, right? When I say white supremacy, I am talking about the assumed views and values of white, Western European descended, able-bodied, cisgender, heterosexual, Christian males as normal, right, and good. And everything else is other. It's made strange and it is punished for not adhering to those particular views and values. So now when we think about white supremacy, it's even different from white people because people of color can ascribe to the views of white supremacy and harm other people of color. So now when we think about white supremacy, it's important to understand it as a material relationship. It is not one that just exists in people's minds, but because it exists in people's minds, what happens on the ground in the material realities of the day intently harm particular groups of people. So now if we think about this, in a particular way, critical race theory now begins to put us into a different conversation. And that conversation makes a lot of people upset because it has returned us to coming to grips with what does it mean to live in a land founded on slavery, genocide, and settler colonialism. Again, this is not the happiest this is not the happiest epidemics of injustice session. I won't front, but it's important for us to really understand that if you live in a country that is founded on those three tenets, then everything you will see in the, in the country will be reflective of those tenets. Now, the important thing, and critical race theory talks about this, is that people have resisted it. Right, So people have always resisted white supremacy in the form of enslavement, in the form of wrongful land appropriation in terms of settler colonialism and in terms of genocide. So there has always been resistance. And a big thing around why you see this rebuke of historical analysis in K-12 schools is because when people, people feel that if young folks understand that there has always been resistance, then they themselves will resist too, right? So schooling is much less about education than it is about compliance and control, right? So now when we come to, come to grips with that, something like critical race theory is saying, we've been here for a long time. And a lot of people thought the upheaval of the election of Donald Trump brought us into this kind of dark ages. But critical race theory reminded folks, no, we've been here for a long time and we've actually seen Donald Trump before historically, right? That's who Andrew Jackson was, right? Andrew Jackson kind of positioned himself as a know nothing and resulted in the genocide of indigenous people, right? He justified the genocide of indigenous people and you all in public health, the behavioral sciences, medical sciences and physical sciences know this better than most folks when you talk about things like the Trail of Tears and the intentional poisoning 
of indigenous populations with smallpox, right? So when this gets included in our conversation in high school history class, the assumption by mainstream white America is that this teaches folks to hate America or hate certain groups of people. And that's not it. The thing is, if you know this to be true, then you will work with others to see that it never happens again, right? And that's always, that's always the rub. That's always what people are fearing. And when we don't have this understanding, everything is rooted around fear because we refuse to engage history. We, inf we refuse to engage the current moment, what's happening and the ways in which it is happening. So let me bring out a couple of tenets of critical race theory that become important. One is that race is a social construction, right? And I'm glad I'm speaking to you all in public health, med medicine, physical and behavioral sciences, because this is what we know. There are no physical or genetic capabilities that distinguish the human body, right? We know that particular environments can deeply impact humans, but a hierarchy of races is false science. So race becomes socially constructed around power. Who is rightfully in a position of power just by the lot of them being born and who is subject to that power? So now when we ask this broader question around the social construction of race, it really becomes critical for us to understand that this idea of biological race or biological determinants of race is false. Please read the work of Dorothy Roberts. She talks about this and the ways in which it comes up in the lives of black women in terms of what has been assumed of their bodies and then how they are treated because of those assumptions. Please check out David Ansel's book, The Death Gap, right? He talks about the ways in which people have assumed, made assumptions and not paid attention to the ways in which particular medical conditions are exacerbated by environment, right? So now when we start to think about this in particular ways, critical race theory says, we need to understand this social construction of race. Second thing that becomes important is something called interest convergence, right? Some people refer to it as uh, historical materialism, but what interest convergence says is that mainstream white society will only move towards racial justice to the extent that mainstream white society remains in power, right? So you will only get it, and Derrick Bell starts to research this in terms of the Brown v. Board decision and the space race. So Russian, Russia already beat the, beat the United States into space with Sputnik. They actually wanted to look good in the eyes of the international community because if they looked, if the United States looked good in the eyes of the international community, they could share resources to fight communism. So in order to look good in the eyes of the international community, they began to engage in some racial justice policies and strategies, and one being Brown, which declared segregation unconstitutional. And it's an important caveat. Brown did not end segregation. In, 2020, in 2022, right now, US public schools are more segregated than they were in 1954. And it's important to put that in our conversation because when we put that in our conversation, then it allows us to understand the ways in which racism, white supremacy becomes 
unspoken and assumed, right? So if people are in a bad position, we don't look at the context of the position. We just assume on their bodies that something is wrong with them. And what we see longitudinally that white supremacy has deemed this to be true, but if you start to speak to it or the things that impact it, now you are harming white people, right? And that sounds strange to folks, but this becomes important when we look at schools because when we look at schools currently, you'll see this claim that talking about enslavement, talking about reconstruction, talking about white supremacy harms white children. Now, as an educator, the first thing I say is, well, damn, have the, has anybody considered the experiences of people of color in the United States and the harm and violence that has happened to them by way of curriculum and US public schools? And if the worry is about harming white kids, the first thing, if somebody is upset, then the first thing is saying, you should be upset. And because you're upset, now we have marked a new set of work to do. So now your work as the upset white child is to make sure that this never happens again. That is your commitment to justice. And now that's the responsibility. So this whole thing around being upset is absurd, right? Now, it comes into another point. And I think this also becomes important. I would encourage folks to check out this organization called the Daughters of Liberty. Now the Daughters of Liberty have done some pretty wild stuff. I mean, it, it sounds comical, but in other ways is deeply serious. Give you all a first example. You can look this up and it's just called the seahorse controversy. And I'm glad I'm talking to y'all in, in public health and the medical sciences and physical and natural sciences. People know how seahorses reproduce, right? So seahorses reproduce frontally where their stomachs are connected, right? And the male identified seahorse actually carries the offspring and gives birth. The Daughters of Liberty felt that it was too racy to show Seahorses connected by the stomach doing what they do in the natural world. Now, the first thing I said was when I saw this, I said, wow, <laughs> like people, people have really taken this to a whole new level. I mean, seahorses for real. Okay. They come back and say that teaching second and third graders about civil rights harms them. So I'm saying to myself, how, how are you harming young folks talking about the civil rights struggle and what people did to resist? So now it's a content question. What are you teaching about the ways in which folks resisted or are you, or are you just focusing on the pain and degradation? Right, so now, and you know, some of you all out there might be like, well, it's not age appropriate. Look, and I think this is important to say, if a young person is old enough to experience white supremacy in the form of marginalization, isolation, and containment, they are old enough to be given accuracy and responsible accuracy in terms of telling the story in a way that makes sense, that is palpable, and that can be connected to other historical moments. That is our responsibility. So now when we think about it in this way, it pushes us to begin to recognize what it is that we're up against. So when you see the Stop Critical Race Theory websites and you get the Stop Critical Race Theory on Facebook and people are talking about, you know, this is bringing communism into our schools or what have you, and we need to ban their books. A couple of, actually, a couple of my books have actually been banned by a couple of school districts, right? I, I kind of wear that as a badge of honor now, right? So I, I've been banned now, right? You know, it's uh, more to the party, right? So now when we begin to think about this, it's really a reminder of where we've been for some time our inability to address white supremacy puts us in this moment. So we've been here for quite some time 
And even if you start to think about it, you know, many of you all work in communities who are experiencing health disparities. Many of you all study the structural components of health disparity. And it's important to put this in a broader conversation, right? And being a Chicagoan, I always begin to think about there are certain people in Chicago who have been valued and there are certain people in Chicago who have been made disposable. We can see who is valued by the schools they go to, the resources in those schools, the houses that, that they live in, the access to health care, and their access to living wage employment. Those are the people who have been valued. The people who have, who have been disposable still don't have access to vaccines. The people who have been left disposable have had decades long individualized histories with inaccess to healthcare, long-term respiratory problems and preventable disease. The folks who have been declared disposable have schools where the physical plant is in disrepair and not cleaned, making a worse situation for the spread of disease. Those people who have been declared disposable here in Chicago are largely Black and Latinx. They have been declared disposable since Black and Latinx people have set foot in Chicago. So now we have to ask a different set of questions. And those questions, unfortunately, are not nice. And because our race conversation in the United States is so tragic and terrible, because we don't do it, critical race theory is the perfect boogeyman to get folks fearful, right? Oh, we're going to talk about white supremacy. Oh, we've never talked about that. Things are great here. For whom? Under what conditions? And how do you define great if other folks have to be at the expense of what it is that you, ex that you take to have access to life-sustaining entities, entities? Quality education, access to healthcare, living wage employment, housing. So now if we begin to think about this, this pushes us in a different direction. And I want to push our thinking a little bit here in Chicago. And I want to use a little bit of data. Now, again, if you all couldn't tell, I'm a pretty much a Luddite. So I don't have any slick PowerPoints. And I know in public health and medicine, y'all be up on those slides. Well, the slides be, slide game is cracking, right? So everybody, you, go, you come to a public health, presentation, y'all got about 50 slides on deck, right? You know, School of Medicine, y'all got another 30 slides ready to ride, right? So I have none of those, but I got a couple of data points that will uh, hopefully get us to think about some things. The city of Chicago had 797 recorded homicides in 2021. Those 797 reported homicides, and it's important to say reported because that there's, a, an act, there's always an inaccuracy in the number, right? So those 797 homicides that were recorded happened in about eight zip codes. In those eight zip codes, you also saw something else. You saw the least access, to housing, to healthcare, living wage employment, and healthy food. Many of those communities have experienced inaccessibility to those things that I just mentioned for decades. Those communities are largely Black and Latinx. And when we look at school closings, those communities are largely Black. So now when we start to think about 
something like homicide, we need to pay attention to the context in which homicides occur. And I'm putting this in a conversation that I had with a retired police officer who told me this thing and it, st it just sticks in my mind. He says, look, I'm gonna tell you how to make a killer. He says, this is all you have to do. You don't have a viable place for them to live. You don't have a viable place for them to eat. You don't have a viable school, don't have a viable school for them to go to. You don't have any viable place for them to work. Then you put them in the same area with all the stress and despair with the hope that they will exterminate each other. And you hire me as police to contain them. And then he stopped and he said, no, that's not how you make a killer. That's how you make a monster. Because we know, and this is him speaking as a former police officer, he said, we know that no black or brown child born in the world has a natural propensity to crime. It is the conditions that influence the particular understandings that could manifest in what we would refer to as a criminal infraction. And when he said that, the first my first response was, that's it. So when we see homicides in Chicago, I think of much of the conflict that resulted in that homicide was engineered by lack of quality education, access to healthcare, living wage employment, and housing. We won't say that on the news because that has too many syllables and won't make the lead line. So now, if we begin to think about something like critical race theory that reminds us of what this thing is that we're in, then the question becomes, why does that become the boogeyman? Why does that become the threat? And you know, you all more than a lot of folks in the world actually know what works, especially when we talk about deterrence to crime, right? And crime reduction. There is no greater strategy or capacity to reduce crime than to have folks having access to living wage employment, access to viable health care, access to quality education, access to healthy food, and long-term sustainable housing. We know this, but the United States is the world's largest incarcerator. 25% of every person incarcerated in the world is in the United States. One out of four people who are incarcerated in the world are right here. Tom Dart 10 years ago called Cook County Jail the largest mental health institution in the world. So now when we think about this in terms of what it is that we are in, we also have to begin to, direct, to address what are the strategies that we will engage to change our condition. Because critical race theory isn't just saying, oh, this is bad, oh, this is terrible. I don't want y'all to leave tonight saying, damn, I heard Stovall and he just said, it's all terrible, we all gonna die, just walk away, right? No, that's not it. The real thing, and it's a section of critical race theory called critical race praxis that challenges us to put action and reflection in the world in order to change it. And that thing says, well, if we understand that we exist under these conditions, then we have to work in community with folks to change them because it is very clear as to what works. The thing that we're up against is that there are structures and systems that declare certain people valuable and certain people disposable. And often that is along the lines of race, class, gender, age, ability, sexual orientation, and disability. 
And that's what critical race theory is reminding us. So when you all see the boogeyman reports and critical race theory is coming to get you, we need to take critical race theory out of schools. That's the boogeyman. The real attack is if young people are engaged with historical accuracy, they will ask questions that many adults who want to remain in power cannot answer. And when the young folks are, are fed up with them not getting answers, they will take matters into their own hands. And that is actually what permeates change in a land founded on slavery, genocide, and settler colonialism. Right? It is not, a, not the friendliest conversation, but one that we have to have. And when we have it, now it pushes us to think about this in different ways. And if we think about our work in different ways, then what we do on the ground looks differently, right? It looks different, it feels different, and it's engaged. Many of you all in public health talk about community-based participatory action research. It is impossible to do that unless you are in community with folks, meaning that you are listening and you are suspending your expertise because the understanding is that nobody knows the best solution more than people who are experiencing the issue. So now what your job is, is to fuel those resources to get folks what they need because they need it. We call that equity, right? So now when we think about this in different ways, now something like critical race theory pushes us to not only understand that we've been here for a long time, but also that we know the way out. The issue is to what extent will we do it? And if we do it, now who feels threatened? And why do they feel threatened? All right, so critical race theory is just pushing us to think about how we name and address white supremacy. And when we do that, we are clearer around what the work is moving forward. And I think that's important to state when we um, now start to talk about things like critical race theory and we're seeing all this fodder. And interestingly enough, all, a lot of the opponents of critical race theory don't even know what the hell it is, right? When you ask them, so what, what is this thing that you, what is the problem that you have with critical race theory? Well, it's bad. Uh, that's not enough, homie. We need to, we, we need a little, we need a little bit more, right? And now, because we need more, it's pushing folks to explain themselves. Because what white supremacy wants to do is to have you believe a lie so that it maintains its power. So critical race theory is saying we must actively interrupt the lie. And we interrupt the lie by doing our work in a different way. And when we do our work in a different way, we're all the better because we are working to end those things that harm us. Abolitionists have a point. We must be clear about the things that have harmed us and we must work with all our fidelity to eliminate those things. So now, Critical race theory, more so than the boogeyman, is a call to action. And I think it's important to stay that to clear the air in terms of what we're seeing and now allowing us to dig deeper in those spaces. Now, I have probably talked hella too long, but I just wanted to put uh, those couple of concerns out there and then we can just kind of open it up for, um, for questions. And thank y'all for lighting up the chat. I truly, truly um, appreciate it in terms of folks being uh, actively engaged in the process. Thank y'all.
Thank you so much, Dr. Stovall. Um, I really enjoyed this and I'm sure that everybody in the chat has been enjoying it as well. As you said, people are just lighting up the chat. Um, so we are have some time for um, verbal questions as well as we've been kept, keeping track of the ones in the chat. So we're just kind of kind of go back and forth. So do a verbal, then do a written, verbal written um, until we're kind of out of time. So um, if people have verbal questions, feel free to raise your hand and then we can unmute you. Um, I'll give it a second. If not, then we'll go to the writing questions first. Uh, yes, Leah, let me unmute you. Hi, Dr. Stovall. I just wanted to say thank you. This was so wonderful. Um, I had a question that I did put in the chat, but I'm just gonna voice it. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a lot about the historical context around CRT. And obviously, like you said, none of this is new and none of this is um, like a, a, a new revelation. So I was wondering if you could speak about like how the current atmosphere around CRT is providing either opportunities or setbacks for actually moving forward with CRT into these conversations so that we're not, you know, just in the endless cycle of this is important, we should talk about it, but then not actually doing it. Yep. Yeah, no, thank you for that, Leah. Uh, in terms of some of the setbacks, some of the setbacks is that this, this attack is coming hard, right? I mean, they, they're mobilizing themselves to the point of absurdity, right? So when Mouse gets eliminated, you know, the seahorse controversy, you know, all of these things now kind of speak to the absurdity, but on the serious side, it lets us know that these aren't just kind of randomized attacks. Right? These are planned attacks. These are organized attacks. So that's one of the things to think about as an obstacle. I think a silver lining in this, if we could call it this, is really kind of having folks articulate themselves. Right. So if the issue is in curriculum in schools, what is it that you want to be taught? Right. And is it, and one of the things that I've found to be very uh, successful in kind of getting a conversation going is saying, well, what is the issue here? And more importantly, in school spaces, K-12 schools, what is the American obsession with myth? And why have we banked so hard on myth? And what does it mean to interrupt that myth that we know is not true. So now, are we deciding to side with myth because it is safe? Or are we willing to get our hands dirty and now grapple with the historical record, right? By using things like primary sources and the words of the actual people saying them. So now it's, that brings our conversation to a different space. And another thing that I've seen in terms of getting the conversation is going, going and saying, well, what's the issue here? If we can't even define something like critical race theory in terms of what it is that we're opposed to, what is the concern? And it either projects the conversation or it stops the conversation because now they know what you're up to, right? They know, they know that there's no way, there's no place to really go after that, right? Because now you'll start, folks, if they're not clear about it, they'll just start spewing these, uh, these lies, right? But it's really around stating, if this is the issue and concern, why is it now thought about as threat? When does historical accuracy become a threat? And when you ask folks those questions, then they get, they get beside themselves. But I think it's their important questions to continually raise because what it does is really allow people who may be on the fence about things to understand it in a different level and to be able to ask their own questions about it. Because the big thing around these attacks is not having people ask their own questions. They're concerned about a group think, right? If this thing is bad, then we should all organize it around it because it's bad. And opposed to saying, we haven't even talked about what it is. And then if we talk about what it is, then we can actually say whether or not it's beneficial or detrimental. But I think those things, it's really on us in terms of that opportunity 
to really engage this conversation around America's commitment to myth over historical accuracy. I think that's a really important piece because now it's not this kind of battle of conjectures where people are just kind of going at each other. It's really kind of calming it down and saying, okay, what's on the table here? Why are we concerned? And then if we can't articulate the concern, then why are we doing it, right? So I think that's really become important. Now, again, back to those obstacles, folks have really organized themselves to kind of take over school boards and to eliminate a bunch of processes. So the battle ahead is going to be tough. But I think this thing around being consistent in our strategies and processes really become important when we're in those conversations with people. Thank you for that question. Thank you. So the next question we have is from the chat and um, it asks, how do we encourage those who discriminate against individuals who are harmed by structural racism to empathize with them rather than discriminate against them? I find it very frustrating trying to show people how their discriminatory views are insensitive and do not consider how terrible living conditions harm individual, individuals. Additionally, how do we show people who disagree with teaching CRT its importance? Right. And, you know, I never think about I never think about this as proselytizing, right? Or trying to convince folks, right? I'm much more of the space of saying, let's just take this, let's take this for what it is. And now can we ask a different set of questions around it? And can we begin to think about words like fault, right? Because a lot of times we think about who's to blame, right? And when you talk about structures, it's harder to name individuals, right? Because the US criminal legal system is based on these individualized claims. But when you talk about structures, now you have to talk about history. Now you have to talk about who has historically been advantaged, who has historically been declared disposable. We gotta talk about the rationales. We gotta talk about a longitudinal process. And I think it really becomes important around breaking these particular words, these things down, and thinking about introducing new words, right? Like disinvestment, right? So if you think about investment as putting something into folks, disinvestment is taking those things away, but through structures. An excellent piece that documents how this operates in Chicago is an article by ta Coates called The Case for Reparations. And it breaks down how housing operates on the west side of the city and how it operated for years in terms of contract buying leases, right? Or contract leases. And what that strategy did and eliminated folks from being able to even buy homes or keep them or repair them, right? So. When you see an area that has come to be in disrepair, that's not, that's not necessarily because of a neglect, but that's be largely because of structures that would not allow for that place to be repaired, right? So it's really around thinking about the ways in which we can engage the conversation to say, what is the issue here? And how did we get to this point, right? And let's get away from the fault of the individual and let's look at the context of the condition. And when we do that, that allows us to have a very different conversation. Great, thank you. Are there any more live chats we have, or live questions? We have time for one live question and then one from um, the chat as well. But if not, we'll do two chat questions. Oh, um, uh, Zoe, I got this question from uh, Fatima in the chat. Okay. Um, so how do you approach someone who responds to historical accuracy as, as not being bad as the what people make it out to be? There are many people that will say we have to come, we've come so far in terms of racism. How can we challenge their thinking by introducing that these oppressive systems still exist? This is a really important question, Fatima, in terms of 
this, and this is always a response, and I would always use it in reference to President Obama. I, I would I always say individual successes do not make for collective victories, right? Barack Obama being elected as the 44th president of the United States does not mean that black people are free. And all we have to do to understand that is look at housing, healthcare, education, employment, and access to healthy food. And we, when we look at who has been structurally denied those processes, we can't begin to talk about we've come so far because those people who have come that far have been selected by mainstream white society as the examples to be lauded. But if you do not reach that same pinnacle, you are blamed for your lot, right? So this thing around really taking that into account and really putting forward that the, the conversation really is about race relations have gotten better for whom? And it's really only for the folks who choose to deny white supremacy, right? And say that it doesn't exist and it's really the fault of the, of the person who is in this bad situation. But when we look at things like incarceration, the biggest thing around incarceration is not folks going in, but folks returning when they are released. So now we have to ask a different set of questions. It pushes us to now think about these questions differently. Yeah. All right, um, so I'll ask one more question and then we'll close out for the evening. The last chat question I have is, what are the implications of movements in science and policy to remove the term race, like genetics research is shifting to ancestry, acknowledging that race is a social construct? Yeah, and that's actually more accurate, right? Because if folks talk about ancestry, then you can talk about region and context, right? And then you can also talk about, it allows you to open up the space to now talk about the structures that were affecting folks in that place. Now, the other part of that is that when you have this conversation of ancestry as the portal conversation, now when we look at context, we also have to look at the relationship to white supremacy, right? So it's not around removing white supremacy in our understanding, but it's now about contextualizing it. And, and a word like ancestry allows a gateway for us to enter the experience and then contextualize what was happening in that space. So it's like, when you watch the show with Henry Louis Gates and it's finding your rules and blah, 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 and it's rare that he talks about this was happening during this time, right? And then when this was happening, there were certain folks who were given certain affordances and other folks who were not. And I noticed a small shift in that. He got critiqued on that and now he, start, he just started to do it, right? So this thing around really the context, history is context, right? And it allows for us to understand the particular moment. And it allows us to understand the parallels to the current day, right? So when we talk about voter suppression, voter suppression has been an issue in the United States for the last two centuries, right? So this thing around really putting it in context and that context allows us to make those parallels and to ask a different set of questions. Great, thank you so much. So that concludes our lecture for this evening. Um, thank you again, Dr. Stovall for being here. We really appreciate your time. Um, I learned a lot today. I hope everybody else learned a lot today. Um, as always, um, if you enjoyed the session, we really encourage you to donate so that we can continue to put on these lectures, bring amazing people like Dr. Stovall. Um, and thank you everybody. Um, and I'll just put the link in the chat as well. Students, as a reminder, um,